I'll tell you that people are people. No matter whether you're working on a team that's a team of volunteers, a little league coaching team, or a giant uh, corporate team in the boardroom trying to figure out what's next for your business, the people product is still the same. Now, if you're like my husband and my son, you might be someone who hated team projects when you were at BU. My husband and I were in seminary together, and I can remember being in an introduction to systematic theology class when we were given a group project. And he was in one team and I was in another, and my team was off and running and having a lot of fun. And he and his best friend were in this other team that was falling apart. And before I knew it, he had gotten special dispensation to not have to be on the team project. And so he and his best friend did their own team project. Why did they do this? Because everybody else on their team wasn't showing up for the team meetings. Now, you know, a BU professor is not likely to let you get away with skipping a team project, but this professor was so convinced that my husband and his best friend were being honest that she didn't want them to be stuck with a team full of problem people that were gonna ruin their project. Now, I have been on those team projects where things aren't working the way that you want them to work. But I have always found a way around it. And over time, I've developed that way around it into a specific system so that when I'm building a team, I'm hopefully building a team that's not going to have those problems. But after I've built the team and those problems arise, as they do because people are people, we also have techniques for feeding that team in the right way so that the team continues to be productive and innovative and energized. And then also how you create that team unity so that the team stays focused and purposeful. So let's talk about how that happens. The first thing you've gotta do is find the right team. Now finding the right team is challenging at best but it makes all the difference in the world to have a team that you like working with. Now, I realize in sometimes in our business lives, we don't have a lot of choice about the team that we're given, but sometimes we do have a choice. So when you have a choice, make the choice wisely. You wanna find team members who are not going to be the groaners, right? That's what makes a team project fail is whenever you have those people who are always grumbling or complaining or turning in shoddy work. Well, the other thing that makes the team fail is when the team starts giving all of its attention to those people. Have you ever been in that kind of a team project? Remember back to your BU days, whenever all of you are trying to save the person who's failing on the project? This can happen in the workplace too. But when we start giving that kind of time and attention to the people who are failing, we're not working from our strengths. And so I want to encourage you to always be working from your strengths and the strengths of your team. Your team's strengths rest with the team's best members. And that's where you're gonna to wanna to give your time and attention. I call those team members your explorers and your champions. And later on in the webinar, I'll give you more definitions and explanation of how to find those explorers and champions and how to identify them. But let me give you the shortcut here. Your explorers and champions are the ones who show up. They're the ones who say yes. They're the ones who are constantly learning and retooling. They're the ones that show up for a webinar like this. They're the ones who stay late and come up and arrive early. You want those people who've really caught the vision of whatever your project is or your business's purpose is or your church's mission is so that you and your team can be working out of your strengths. So Jeff, let's go ahead and go to that first teaching slide so we can talk about how you find those people. Sorry, I pulled up that first poll. Um... Oh, yes, let's do this. So how do you feel? Let's, let's have a little fun here first before we go into the teaching slides. How do you feel about a new team project? You'll see that on the survey thing there. Do you like to bring it on? You're ready for a new team project? Or do you groan? Oh no, not another team project. Or you're okay with the team project? Great, as long as I get to pick my team. Or do you live in a world where you get to say, what's a team? I'm always on my own. 
be interesting to hear how many of you uh, actually get to always work on your own and never have to be on a team. So go ahead and fill out that survey when you get a chance and uh, we'll see what the results are in just a few minutes. But for now, let's talk about how do you find that right team. Well, the first thing you're going to do is you put your positive people first. Now, listen and notice who are those positive people because you wanna be finding that right team by finding those positive people. Now, sometimes it's the person who always has something positive to say, an innovative and interesting idea that they want to bring to the table. But sometimes it's the person who has the challenging question. Those are positive people because they're engaged and interested in what you're talking about, that they're questioning the vision or they're questioning the plan to fulfill the vision. Those are positive people. And of course, the people say, who say yes and raise their hand, ready to work on the new project or ready to join a task force to think about what innovation is needed next. And who has the faithful response? Who's willing to ask, how can I be a better part of this team? Those are your positive people. And then who looks for solutions when everything else seems stuck? Those are your positive people. You see, these aren't just Pollyannas. You don't need yes-sayers who just say yes for the sake of being positive and kind, but you want solution-oriented, active, engaged, energetic people on your team. And you want people who are so committed to the vision that they'll say yes when they need to say yes, ask challenging questions when challenging questions will get you where you need to go faster and further, and who are so committed to the vision that they're willing to find solutions when you're stuck. So think about those positive people. Take just a minute to visualize who on your team is already there. Because later in this seminar, we're gonna talk about who's already there and how you give them your time and attention. If you're taking notes, it's a good time to jot down who's already there. Who are your positive people that you know are on your team and that are going to get you where you need to go faster and further? Mary, sorry to jump in here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, publish the results of the poll and uh, nice. hopefully you can see those. But um, some of our kind viewers have let me know that there's a little bit of a display issue. So I'm gonna close your slide deck for a second okay. and try to fix something on my end. I apologize. Uh, for the That's okay. uh, so what I love here is that we have um, almost 90% of you uh, being enjoying teams so no wonder you're on this project on this uh, webinar because you're already committed to teams so I don't have to convince you to be committed to teams here's a little secret my husband isn't on the webinar <laughs> So that's okay. Those of us who lead teams and work with teams, we know we have to be effective at leading and working with teams. And that's what this is all about. So in finding the right team, the next thing to the second step of putting positive people first is to choose and prioritize loving people. Now, I know I'm a church leader, so you might think that in the church, that's really easy to do, because if you're not involved in church or synagogue, you might have this wonderful stereotype that those of us who are involved in church, synagogue, mosque, temple, are automatically loving. But guess what? People are people. So even in churches, I have to teach leaders to put their loving people on the priority list. Those are some of your best team members. Now, I'm not talking about Pollyanna loving. I'm talking about loving the vision, loving and caring for their neighbors, and loving and caring for themselves. So when you have those loving people on your team, they spread that kind of compassion and love to the full team. These are people who are healthy mentally, spiritually, and socially. And we, we give them our priority and put them on our teams. They help our teams be stronger and help our teams move forward more, co more cohesively. People who love others do so because they love themselves. And people who love themselves well have an easier time loving others. So it's really valuable to have them on the team. And guess what? Loving people attract other loving people. So people that are more like them and have that positive loving energy are attracted to your team and to the project that you're working on. And then the health of your team occurs organically. And it's really great whenever the team becomes healthy organically 
Otherwise, you have to go off on a million retreats to build teams, to build health, put people into therapy, that kind of thing. So the more loving people, the more positive people you have on your team, the healthier your team already is right out of the starting gate. And the third piece of finding the right team is to look for unexpected partners on the team. Sometimes, depending on what kind of business you're in or what kind of university you work at, it's always the same departments that get together. For instance, I'm working with a small university in the Midwest, and one of the challenges there, I work with the director of development, is that development only communicates with alumni relations in that university. Now, it's not a huge university, but they don't really cross paths with the athletic association, for instance. Well, there's a lot of fundraising that goes on in the athletic association. They don't really work with the fine arts department. It's a big fine arts department with a lot of donors who specifically want to give to the arts. So one of the things that we've worked on there is who are the unexpected partners that development had never worked with before? And now by reaching out to the arts department, reaching out to the athletic association, they are finding that their development processes can be integrated so they're not asking donors at the same time for, for various gifts to different departments. It's now integrated and streamlined. That was an unexpected partner for development to start thinking, oh, we should be working with the athletic association, not just the alumni association. And so you want to be looking for those unexpected partners. If you run a small business, it might be the competitor business down the street. What if the competitor business has an edge to their products that's different than yours? There may be two, two UPS stores in town, or there's a UPS store and a FedEx store, but you have different working hours, your small businesses. How can you partner and collaborate so that one of you is open on Sundays and one of you gets open on Saturdays? This is another way of finding those unexpected partners. If you work in a nonprofit or again, in a, a business that is a central part of your community, you might also be looking at who's the mayor, who's on city council, who are some artists in the community that really support our business or our work, and how might they might be partners with us? How might they help us understand the, the customers, the community that we serve? Those people can be really valuable parts of your team, especially if you're trying something new, if you're innovating or you're trying to reach a larger customer base or a new customer base. Looking for those unexpected partners can become a part of finding the right team. So now I want to talk to you about my favorite tool. And uh, uh, this new tool that I'm going to unveil comes because of a story I once heard about two wolves. I want to make sure that you are feeding the wolves that will help you grow. And I learned about this from an old Cherokee parable called The Legend of the Two Wolves. It's a story about a little boy, well, maybe not that little, 11 or 12, and he goes to see his grandfather, who's the tribal chief, and says, Grandpa, I I'm, I'm really struggling because I feel like there's a part of me that really wants to do the right thing, and there's a part of me that wants to do the wrong thing, and I can't figure out who I'm becoming and what I'm supposed to do. And grandfather says to his son, son, even in me, there are two wolves always struggling. The little boy looks at his grandfather in shock. Really? There are two wolves in you also? Yes, there are two wolves in me also. One just that wants to be light and life, to bring positive energy and make the world a better place, that wants to care for my family, be kind to my neighbors, that wants to really live into my purpose in this world. And then there's this other wolf who is angry and snarling and negative and, and dis disastrous. Even whenever the family is being good to me, he snaps and he snarls and he grumbles and he complains. And he constantly wants me to, to win and be on top of everyone else and always be the head wolf, no matter how much harm I have done. And the little boy looks at his grandfather, very frightened. Grandfather, I had no idea. And the grandfather said, the war is always raging within me as to which wolf will win. And the little boy said, which wolf will win, grandfather? And he said, the wolf I feed will win. In our teams, we often feed the snarling wolves. We don't mean to, but they grab so much attention. They're so loud. Their bark is so fierce 
that they can really derail a team. And so I've developed a tool to encourage you to feed the right wolves. Because once you've gathered the right team or you've just gathered the team that you are stuck with, the wolves are there struggling within the team. You have team members who are snarling and grumbling and cranky. And you have other team members who are visionaries and energized and innovative. And I certainly have found with my pastor uh, clients that they are tempted over and over again to spend their energies feeding the snarling, grumbling, complaining team members. And when we start giving our time and attention to them, it becomes magnetic. The whole organization starts giving time and attention to those wolves. And then guess what? The wolves within each of us, we are starting to feed those snarling, grumbling, complaining wolves within ourselves. And we become like the wolves that we're feeding on the team. And the whole team can go to negative energy, stuck energy, and get completely lost when we start giving time and attention to those wolves. So I wanna ask you before I give you these tools, who are you feeding on a regular basis? Think about that. Who are you feeding on a regular basis? Michelle Obama, as you can imagine, was often the victim of a lot of complaining and grumbling. And when she was asked once about how does she deal with all that, she just said, when I hear about negative and false attacks, I really don't invest any energy in them because I know who I am. Knowing who you are, knowing who you feed, really will help you have a, a handle on whether or not you're ready to embrace this next tool. Because they're out there, right? The wolves that are trying to drag us backward. If you look on your screen, you'll see that I give those wolves a little nicer name than a bad wolf. These are not just big bad wolves, they're human beings. And at the far end of the spectrum, the place that would pull us backwards from the exponential growth that awaits are the naysayers. They are just always ready to say no. Every new initiative, every new idea, they'll say, we've already tried that, we've already done this, oh my gosh, another task force. And they wanna take our attention. And right beside them are the observers who are just watching to see where everything goes. But when we start giving them our time and attention, guess what? The group goes backwards, not forward. I want you to focus on the champions and the explorers. Champions and explorers are the ones who are gonna take you where you need to go. Champions and explorers are those people who are committed to the team. They're your creatives, they're your innovators, they're your visionaries, they're the lovers, they are the positives. Those people, it's easy to neglect them because they're always getting the job done. They don't need much supervision. Sometimes they are running so fast and furious in front of you that they're further ahead of even the leader of the team. Guess what? If you start giving 80% of your time to your champions and your explorers, your team will start growing and innovating, innovating at an exponential rate. It is not a straight line. It's an exponential growth rate when we start giving our time to champions and explorers. These are the people who are way out in front. These are the people who are already running with the vision. These are the people who are so committed to making your organization the strongest organization possible that they can't help but say yes. Often they're gonna have ideas and innovations before you do. Welcome their ideas, welcome their innovations, even if they seem wild and crazy. The company who probably does this best historically is Pixar. Pixar rewards its innovators. It rewards its champions. It rewards its explorers. When they get together to debate how a film is going along, they have four values they bring to that debate. When the, they call it the brain trust. When the executives get together and hear from the creatives how it's going. It's a completely different way than the way the studio system works in Hollywood. In Hollywood, when the studio system looks at a film, they start focusing on the negatives. What's wrong with the film? Where are you over budget? Let's fix the problems. 
giving 80% of their time and attention to the naysayers, the problems, the observers. But at Pixar, they bring to the table that they're going to have candor, total open and honesty with one another, that they're going to have spirited debate. If you walk past a brain trust meeting at Pixar, you'll hear them yelling and debating and arguing, but then you'll hear them bring their other two values to the table. Lots of laughter and lots of love. Yeah, those are their values when they do their studio exec meeting. They call it the brain trust because they are trusting one another's brains to come up with solutions to make a storyboard the best story possible before it becomes an animated film. Think about your brain trust. Who are the champions and explorers who are gonna bring laughter and love to the table? Who are gonna bring honesty and candor, those challenging questions, and have spirited debate, not debate that puts somebody down or re rewards the naysayers, but debate that starts helping you grow and improve at an exponential rate. Now the power in giving your time and attention to your champions and your explorers is that then your neutrals, which is the vast majority of your organization, they're the people who just go to work, do their job, show up for the volunteer project. They're just kind of going to go along. But when they see the attention and energy going to the champions and explorers, that's where they turn their attention and their energy. So the vast majority of your team, the vast majority of your workforce is now looking forward, looking toward its future, looking toward its innovation, and having more energy and enthusiasm to do so. If you're sending your attention with those naysayers, with the observers and trying to pull them along, the neutrals start looking that way with you. And the neutrals start looking backward to the past, to the stuck, because that's where you're looking. But when you continue to focus on those champions and explorers, and I'm serious when I say give 80% of your time to your champions and your explorers, everything changes on your team. If you're running a company, you can change everything in the company simply by giving 80% of your time and attention to your champions and your explorers. Now, when you start giving those champions and explorers your attention and your time, you're going to want to teach them also where to put their time and attention. You want those champions out front, innovating, exploring, failing, and then coming back and trying to innovate and explore again because it's in their nature. You want those champions right there beside them, following where they lead, so bonding together and supporting one another in the process. But you want to teach your champions and your explorers to look one step back so that they can nurture the group that's right behind them. They, most people can only go one step back. If you ask champions to try to reach back to a naysayer, you're just going to drain your champion dry. But a champion can reach back and bring an explorer along. And an explorer can reach back and bring the neutrals along. And then the neutrals who start becoming explorers, they're the ones who can talk to the observers. Because the observers are going to be irritated with the champions and the explorers. And they're going to drain the champions and the explorers. But they're observing the neutrals. Where are the neutrals paying attention? I kind of want to be part of the pack, right? So the more that you're feeding your champions and your explorers, the more that your neutrals are moving toward becoming explorers and your observers are moving toward becoming neutrals. And guess what? You've taken the wind out of the sails of your naysayers. So they're just observers because no one's listening to their naysaying anymore. They have automatically become observers because their negative energy doesn't have the power on the team that it once had. Now, as you can imagine, this is not an easy thing to live out, but it's an important thing to live out. And one of the ways that you can live it out more easily is if you empower your team, particularly your champions and explorers, to be co-leaders with you. Because then you're not the only one that's leading and trying to feed the positives. So make sure that you are feeding that team so that they can be feeding you. The more that you empower them as partners and co-leaders, the more that you encourage them to spend time together, the stronger the whole team becomes and the easier your job is as a leader. So thinking through who's on your team, who are your champions and your explorers? I wanna ask you, um, 
Are you feeding and nourishing the best team members on a regular basis? I think we might even have a poll where we can test this. Do you think you're feeding your best team members on a regular basis? Think about that. Maybe it's a good time to jot down some notes about who you've been spending time with. Maybe I, I'd say do three columns. I call it the now, how, and the wow column. Under now, start listing who do you spend most of your time with? Under wow, who would you like to be spending most of your time with? And then the how is that tool in between to get you away from spending the time with the nows that you don't want to be spending time with and to the wows that you do want to be spending time with. Now, I hope that you look at the now list and they're all on the wow list. But if they're not, you might find that you're going to need some more help. And that's where I do my greatest work is whenever people need a little more help. And that's what these tools are all about. Now that you've started to identify your champions and your explorers, you can start figuring out a way to schedule time with them. Okay, so we're about 50-50 on how we're doing on feeding the best team members on a regular basis. Here's a clue. You are already champions and explorers. Usually when I do this survey, it's about 20% to 80%. So you're already ahead of the pack. You're a great group, already way ahead of the curve in terms of where you're spending your time and your energy. Um, but let's ask that next question. How much time do you think you give to your difficult team members? One more poll that we're going to put up there and see where you're at. Um, do you think you spend 10% of your time with your difficult team members? Or do you spend 25% of your time? Or are you in that place where a lot of people are at 50% or 80% of your time with your difficult team members? Uh, we'll see how long it takes to get those answers back. But um, I want to get you to the point where you're only spending 10% of your time with your difficult team members. And the more that you keep this chart in front of you, keep these teaching points in front of you, the easier that will be to do. Before I go into my final teaching point, I wanna offer that one-on-one -on -one help to those of you who uh, may already be realizing, ooh, I get this, but I might need a little more help to be really good at it. And that's a lot of my coaching work, a lot of my consulting work is just helping people recognize and get stronger at feeding the right wolves, the champions and explorers on your team and identifying them. And so, uh, as I promised uh, earlier, I am available and offering to anyone who's on this webinar today a free coaching session uh, whenever you might want that. And I'll have Jeff put up the link. You can just go to my Google Calendar and sign up for an appointment, or you can email my assistant at admin at maryciphers.com. Just uh, if you'd like to know more about what I do, or would just like a free coaching session to really work on this tool and hone it to your specific setting, I would be grateful and glad to share my time and gifts with you in that way. Um, so just uh, visit that link or sign up or send an email to my assistant and we'll make certain to spend that extra time together. So let's see how we're doing. How much time do you give to your difficult team members? Okay, so here's the rub, right? And I appreciate your honesty. We, in the previous poll, we were at about 50-50, thinking that about half of us give the, time, the right amount of time to our best team members. But that's probably not exactly true whenever 13% of you are giving 80% of your time to your difficult team members and 37% of you are giving 50% of your time to them. Now I know these are rough numbers, but that means half of you are giving more than half of your time to the most difficult people. And only 35% of you, um, what is that? Uh, no, about half of you giving uh, less of that time. And that 10 to 25% is a, is a much better model. I think what's typical um, when you become healthy as a leader and more focused on this, you can easily get to the 20% mark. And getting to the 10% mark is a big stretch. But if you can get to that 20% mark, and I can see that some of you are close to being there at that 25%, um, that's a sweet spot. If you only have to give 20% of your time to your, um, your, your more difficult team members, that gives you 80% of your time.
to focus on the real objectives of the team and the team members who are your champions and your explorers. I will tell you that the more you give time and attention to your champions and explorers, the less you have to give time to your naysayers and your observers because the team begins moving forward without them and functioning pretty seamlessly even though you have some of those naysayers and observers on the team. It's amazing how difficult people, when we're not giving them time and attention, their difficulties and troublemaking become less difficult and less troublesome. So I want to go on to our last teaching point today so that we also have some time for questions and answers in just a few minutes. And this is step three, which um, I'm going to bring to your attention, and I bet you've heard it all before. The foundation of building your healthy team is to create team unity. Now, if we were all in person, I'd have you raise hands. How many of you think, oh, I've already created team unity, or I've gone to a retreat to create team unity? I know we all know that we're supposed to be doing this, but if I were to ask you honestly, my guess is that fewer than 50% of you feel like you actually have that team unity on your team. It's the living the team unity that is so challenging. And yet team unity is what really keeps people in the champion and the explorer category. You've heard me talk a lot about your champions and your explorers being committed to the vision. Well, the vision is the crucial point to team unity. You create team unity by clarifying your primary purpose. If you don't yet know what it is, then you better identify your primary purpose. What's the vision and purpose for what it is that you're doing? That's the key here. Clarify your primary purpose and everything gets easier for the whole team. They can figure out their priorities. Uh, Jeff, this is slide 16. Um, the more that you can help them figure out their priorities, the easier their life becomes. And the easier it is for champions and explorers to chase after that vision, to help fulfill that vision. But if they don't know what the purpose is, if they're just creating widgets for widgets purposes, if they're just going to meetings because they've always gone to meetings, they're not gonna feel the energy and enthusiasm to be champions and explorers. And then your champions and explorers fade away to neutrality and they're just coming to work and doing their job. But when you have a shared purpose, a clarity of the vision, and everyone knows that, it's so much easier to move forward quickly and easily. So once you've identified that purpose, and I hope that all of you have, uh, know the purpose in your company or your small group or your nonprofit or your church, once you know that purpose, spend some time defining and communicating that purpose for everyone. Help people know that that's where you want them spending their time and energy so that their energy is well directed and um, is fulfilling for them and also sustainable and even growth filled for you and your business. Once you have that clarity of purpose, build joint ownership around that purpose. Work with the purpose often, break it into components, into manageable pieces. Um, I'll go back to another Pixar story. For instance, Pixar's original purpose, you may not know this, was to create a computer that could do um, uh, adequate uh, computer animation. It didn't exist when Steve Jobs helped found the company. He was a computer guy, right? And then he had a couple animators and they wanted to create the hardware for, to create computer, computer animation. They successfully did it but it wasn't a sustainable business model. There weren't enough customers to make the hardware worth all the money they'd invested. Well, the two animators on the team had never really cared about the hardware as their primary purpose anyway. They'd gone to work because their primary purpose was to create the first computer animated film. And so when Jobs said, we, this isn't sustainable, maybe I'll just sell the company, they said, we wanna create a major motion picture that's completely computer animated. The technology didn't exist. Even the hardware they created couldn't exist, but the entire company reformed around that shared purpose. And that shared purpose is what helped them become a profitable company. And also an incredibly creative company and earned them their first Academy nomination because they got the vision of a shared purpose and everyone agreed that's what we're going to do. Even the people that were the Steve Jobs people the computer people caught the vision that everything they were doing in hardware and software was to create an animated computer, a computer animated film. 
So that's how a shared purpose can change a company, can change a small group, can change a business. The other thing is to help people find their stories in that purpose. Where do they fit into the purpose? It can't be just your purpose. It needs to be their purpose. And what is, what is their role in that? And then provide leadership to help them live into that primary purpose. Help them co-lead with you into the primary purpose. And a couple other things about that team. Whenever you've got this team unity going, it's important to promote that team unity with gratitude and celebration. That's one way in which you can be a champion and an explorer for your team. The thank you notes matter. The thank you words matter. The public celebrations of people who've worked hard matter. It creates great energy so that people will continue innovating, continue growing, continue working hard for the vision. And finally, make sure your team is the right size. It's very hard to create team unity when there are 30 people around the table. The ideal size of a team is 12, and I know that's just unheard of in large companies, but the more you can break it down into units of 12, the more successful your teams will be at being unified. It's very hard to unify a team of 30. And for small tasks, teams of three to five are ideal. But you always wanna have a team that's just large enough so that you can share the challenges and the workload. For there will be challenges, and you don't want anybody to have to do the challenges alone. There will be times whenever the wolf I'm feeding is a negative wolf and I will be the challenge. But if I'm on a team that is sharing the workload, they can help bring me back to center and even put me back on the champion and explorer path. So thank you for joining me today. And um, I'm really open to what questions you might have about how you find the right team, how you feed the right team, and how you create that team unity so that the team is strong enough to be constantly energized and constantly innovating to reach new customers, produce new products, and uh, create new opportunities to reach and serve the people that you are called to serve. So what questions do you have? Mary, this is great. Thank you so much for uh, doing this presentation for us today and also for this great offer that you've, you've made to all the folks who've tuned in. <clears throat> Um, we do have one great question from Susan that's come in. And, and again, I'll remind folks to, to take advantage of this chance to ask Mary some questions and, and type in using the Q&A feature. Mary, Susan's uh, question is, what, what if she finds herself in a toxic environment? What are some pointers you have for the leader to be more loving and more willing to be an explorer when you may see yourselves heading more towards becoming a naysayer? It's Susan, correct? Susan, yeah. Susan, this is a really common problem and a challenge in almost any organization. It's probably the number one question I get when I'm working with church leaders. And that used to surprise me. And now I just remember we're all humans, right? So in a toxic environment, um, one of the most important things is to feed the wolf within you that is healthy and strong. And even at work, uh, taking breaks away from the toxic environment, if you have to get out of the building, on your lunch hour, just to walk around the building, do so. The energy is different outside of the toxic environment. I'm a big believer that buildings hold energy. We're all matter, right? And so if it's a toxic office, you're gonna wanna not have to be in that office all eight hours of your work day. So giving yourself a break to get out of the office, go get some fresh air. When you're in the office and you're in a meeting, let's say, where the toxicity is, is huge, and you can feel yourself being pulled into that toxicity. It's really wise to take a deep breath, pause before speaking, and really check in. What can I say? How can I interact that will bring a healthy antidote to this? If you think about toxic antidote, just pause and think, is there any antidote that you have in you? For instance, um, I was in a church meeting recently where a woman in the meeting said, oh, when I'm afraid and fear is coming up, I say to myself, antidote, faith. For her, when fear comes up, she's just gone through a really messy divorce and she's always worried about money and, and, and her really very toxic ex-husband. And so when that fear comes up, and she might want to re-engage with him, might want to get angry and snarl back. 
she just has this touch word for her. The word is faith, faith. And it causes her to pause before she responds to the ugly text message or before she goes out and yells back at him when he's yelling at her. So in toxicity, if you can figure out what your antidote is, what your touchstone is, it's often helpful to have a physical anchor. Like if you have a, some sort of a, a jewel you could put onto a keychain uh, that you can just touch your keychain or maybe a picture on your cell phone. And there are also cell phone apps. Um, if you give me a call, I've got a couple of them. I just can't think of them off the top of my hand. But if you email my assistant, I'll tell you the name of them. There are a couple apps that you can click on that help you pause and can provide an anchor so that whenever you're getting sucked into that toxic environment, you pause before you engage. Um, I do this in a, I also teach a workshop on conflict competence, and this is a really important tool in conflict competence. You pause before you engage in the conflict because um, otherwise it's not just the naysayer, the observer, the bad wolf, our actual ancient Neanderthal self, you know, the guys who went extinct, it's trying to get back in because in that toxic environment, the fight and flight mode comes up. And so all this adrenaline there, they've measured it. Tons of brain chemistry changes when that happens. But if you pause and take a deep breath, your wonderfully evolved brain and the frontal lobes that connected back whenever you were about 25 can re-engage and guide your actions. So those are the two things I would say, get out of the building, and give yourself a break. And when you're in those toxic environments, pause before responding and interacting. I hope that's helpful, Susan. I'm gonna ask two uh, questions that are similar from both Alexandra and Sabrina. Um, when you're on a, uh, a task force or a project group, um, if you've got somebody who uh, in, in your organization has a higher title uh, oversees the work that you're doing, whether it's your direct boss or somebody on another team who's more senior to you. How do you, how do you manage that situation when that person is the one bringing the negative energy? Um, uh, how do you ch how do you change the project energy or or your in individual relationship with your supervisor when you feel like that higher person is the one who's who's bringing the negative energy in? Uh, this is another challenge, and the approach to it depends on your relationship with your supervisor. If you have a relationship where candor and honesty is, is allowed, and I know it isn't in all environments, you have some options. I'm gonna talk about those options first. But the other piece on that is, do you have one-to-one um, -one access to your supervisor? If those two things, if you can say yes to those two things, candor and honesty are allowed in your work environment, and you have uh, direct access individually to your supervisor, then uh, setting up a meeting with your supervisor um, and just saying, hey, I just learned this new thing about giving energy to champions and explorers. And I know that sometimes we're really stuck in a negative mode at, at the office because there have been a lot of, a lot of times it's because there are um, threats and weaknesses on the team that causes team leaders to go negative. They're afraid. They're afraid the profits are down. They're afraid the business isn't sustainable. So having an honest conversation, if that environment allows that, again, one-to-one, -one, you would never want to bring it up in front of the team. That would be way too threatening. And um, remember, if you think of the two wolves, this is not where you want to get into a fight and become the winning wolf. This is where you want your supervisor to start feeding the better wolf within her or himself. And so if you have an honest team with your team leader, don't judge them, just ask questions and ask it more generically about, I've noticed the team tends to go negative. And I was just on this webinar about the importance of focusing on our innovative possibilities, our explorations, the possible ways we can champion our vision as opposed to worrying about and, and great griping about our vision. So if you can have that, that of course is the best approach. But I'm also aware it is um, an, a rare uh, workplace where you have that opportunity or where you, even if you have that opportunity where you would feel safe enough to have that opportunity without getting yourself into trouble in the work environment. So the other option is to, in the team meetings, simply ask curious questions. Ask curious questions that are open-ended enough to redirect the conversation but not judgmental questions and not um, leading questions that get people to the answer you want. For instance, uh, it would not be appropriate to say, I wonder if we're just getting a little negative here. 
right after your boss has said a naysaying compliment, comment, right? Because that's clearly an attack. It's some sort of passive aggressive attack on your boss. You don't want to do that. But you could say, would there be any other solution we haven't thought about? Has anybody seen another company solve this in a way we haven't tried yet? Those kind of open-ended curious questions, they cause everyone to pause. Now you've invited everyone to engage their higher brain and to let some of that, when that negative energy is going, everyone's going into fight or flight mode. So solutions are really hard to come up with. And you've just invited everybody to pause. Curious questions usually cause everyone to have no answer for a minute. That no answer for a minute can completely transform a room. Now, some of you, you know, are still asked, I see another question here, when is it time to leave a project or a job rather than trying to push through to change the environment? I think when you've tried that a few times and you've hit a wall, then it's probably time to, to, to move on. Um, life is too short to work in a place where the toxicity rules the day and um, especially if you're not the boss or you're not allowed to lead in your team, uh, you might want to choose a different environment. But we don't always have that luxury. It's not an easy job market out there. And so when you're in the middle of that environment, uh, doing whatever you can do to create health inside of yourself so that you're feeding the wolf that is life-giving and innovative and energizing, whatever you need to do so that that wolf gets your time and attention. Give 80% of your time and attention to the champion and explorer within yourself, and that will help you survive a toxic environment. Sometimes that means taking on your own projects. It's one of the reasons why Google allows their employees to spend, I think 15% of their time can be spent on personal projects. And Google's lifted up as, oh, they're so innovative and wonderful. Part of that is because Google knows it's a very high pressure environment. And um, I have a lot of friends who work at Google here in Irvine, and they say it's a tough environment. You know, the computer world, the tech world is so demanding that stress is high, the workload is heavy. That 15% is really like lifting the lid off of a pressure cooker so the employees can do something to alleviate all that stress. So whatever 15% project you can give to yourself, a walk around the building, your own personal project that maybe you can do on work time, something that you have some power and control over can really help you survive a toxic environment. Um, and if you see it's gonna be an ongoing toxic environment, it's good to start looking at feelers. It can take a year or two to find a new position. So start feeling the lay of the land now for a possible exit plan down the road. If you are a champion and an explorer, workplaces need you. And if you're in an environment where they're not receiving your champion and explorer energy, there are workplaces that will gladly hire you. You just have to find them. I love everything that you said, Mary, I, but I want to make sure I do a little bit of a plug here for both Sabrina and Alexandra. Our next webinar, which is actually coming up next Wednesday, this is a bit of serendipity. It, it's uh, titled, You're Not Alone, Surviving a Toxic Work Environment. Uh, mm -hmm. We do still have some room for that webinar, so I encourage everybody to sign up now on our website. Mary, this was awesome. Thank you so much for you know, giving of yourself and, and sharing your expertise with the BU community. Uh, I also know, I, I had seen that you and your husband BJ have also been really big supporters of BU financially. And, and so I wanna make sure that I, on behalf of the whole BU Alumni Association, just thank you for everything that you, you do for BU. You are very welcome. Really grateful to be here. Thank you all for spending so much time with us today. And I hope to uh, see some of you on a coaching call in upcoming weeks. <clears throat> thank, you, Jeff. thank you, Mary, and, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I also want to thank all of you who've, who've donated to BU in the past. I mentioned our great webinar coming up next week. Uh, you can sign up for that now on our website, bu.edu slash alumni. I also want to um, do a shout out for our new, uh, relatively new podcast, the alumni podcast. It's called Proud to Be You. I am your host, uh, but we interview interesting and successful alumni who reflect on their BU experience and talk about how it shaped their careers. Uh, we just put out a great episode uh, today, uh, and you can find that wherever you normally find podcasts. Um, if you or someone you know who's a BU alum would be interested in doing a professional development webinar just like this, um, I'm open to hearing from you. I'd love to hear your ideas. I invite you to contact me at the Alumni Relations Office or at jtmurphy at bu.edu. Thank you again, Mary, for your time. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. Uh, 
Thank you all. Have a great day or a great evening, wherever you might be.